I wanted first to just uh, think back a little bit about uh, the lecture we got from Steve Schwartzman on uh, Friday. Uh, before he came, I talked with him in my office, uh, and I had the audacity to ask him if he thought there was any chance that his fortune was just due to luck. Uh, I said, well, we have this efficient markets theory uh, in finance uh, that uh, uh, says that n nobody can beat the market. So what do you think he said? <laughs> well, um, obviously, he believes in himself, but I, I'm inclined to believe in him also. Uh, that efficient markets theory never sounded right. Uh, wh one thing about efficient markets theory that has always bothered me is this idea that the, the so-called smart money uh, sets prices in the market. Um, the thing that bothers me about it is, who is the smart money anyway? It's as if it's an all-or-nothing thing, right? There's the smart money, and then there's the dumb money, and the smart money rules. But isn't there all different gradations of intelligence and insight? So it's not like, why should there be just one level of smart money? So I think he probably exemplifies um, a higher level <laughs> of smart money than smart. And I think a lot of uh, mistakes people make in judging financial markets is uh, b being easily impressed by someone's stockbroker or someone's analyst who, uh, who seems very smart <laughs> and is very smart, but may not be enough to outsmart the markets. Uh, so uh, that's the lesson of efficiency, uh, especially when you're young. I think y you may not realize how many smart people there are in the world. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so when, you when you're dealing in a trying to win in financial markets, you have to take account of who, out who is really out there and how much insight and e effort and research are they putting into their trading, and do you really think uh, you can beat that? Uh, so that's the lesson of efficient market. But I don't think the lesson is that you can't, uh, you can't it's impossible for anyone, no matter how smart, to beat the market. Now, of course, you know Albert Einstein never made any money in the stock market. And in fact, TIAA Kreft, the pension fund, had an ad campaign in which they pointed out that Albert Einstein left all of his pension investing to TIAA Kreft. Well, he was a professor, and uh, th they're a pension fund for professors. So uh, Einstein didn't think he could beat the market. <laughs> and, uh, Mr. Schwartzman very candidly pointed out that he didn't have the greatest uh, math score. Isn't that what, how he put it? He, he th said he was no math genius. And you think finance requires a lot of math. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's something about practical intelligence. Uh, the psychologists have talked about different kinds of intelligence. Uh, this thing is all supposed to be coming up here. Uh, at least we're seeing something now. Uh, that's why I don't like uh, PowerPoint, actually. <laughs> this kind of thing happens. Uh, so, uh, that's it. Uh, and now, okay. Uh, so, uh, I'm not going to use this for a few minutes, so I'll, I'll just blink it out for a moment. Um, but you know, remember Carl Icahn, when he talked to us, said something about uh, he always just had some, he, he was always just good at making money. <laughs> I think, and I think that um, uh, there are separate talents. I mean, some people love markets and they like to think about them and figure out how they work. and. Um, if they have the right kind of intelligence and the right kind of spirit to do the work, they ought to be able to beat the market. When I've talked to Icon a number of times, and I have the idea that he's a very down-to-earth, solid, inquisitive sort. He wants to know what's going on. Um, and when I've talked to him, sometimes he'll ask the same question of me. He's trying to get information from me. He asks the same question from me three different ways, because <laughs> apparently my answer isn't satisfactory. 
And he must think I might know something because he keeps asking. But I think that's a kind of persistence. It's a certain personality trait. So persistence at trying to figure out what really makes things work um, <laughs> is, uh, is important in these, in these markets. And I think it's just uh, relish or inclination to keep thinking about them. So uh, maybe that's why I went into economics as a professor. I don't know that I really am someone who wants to watch the markets all day. <laughs> and so you have to judge your own uh, interest. Uh, so anyway, it was very nice that we got um, that uh, Steve Schwartzman came and uh, uh, told us about his life's work. Um, so anyway, I, I, I wanted to talk today about futures. Uh, oh, well, one more thing I wanted to say about uh, Schwartzman. I was at one point he said very confidently, uh, I thought, now if you heard this right, that this current financial crisis ought to be over in a year, and that uh, he said something, maybe it was a little vague, about, about uh, investing in distressed securities now as an opportunity. Because uh, I think he pointed out that AAA mortgage securities are selling for 80 some cents on the dollar, and it can't be that bad. And uh, this is the same thing that we got from David Swenson, and I've heard it from others that that's the opportunity now. So when, when I hear Steve Schwartzman proclaiming that he thinks this, I thought he said something like that, that this uh, business uh, crisis will be over before long. It made me wonder, you know, do I, <laughs> do I know more than he does <laughs> about that sort of thing? Because I don't think it's going to be over soon. <coughs> then it gets back to, I think, you have to put all these people in perspective. There's so many different kinds of expertise. Um, and when you listen to someone, you always have to ask, well, what does he or she know that, uh, that is specific to their expertise? And I don't think Schwartzman is a macroeconomist. So uh, I don't want to say he's wrong, <laughs> but he might be wrong. We have to just not um, get to put everyone. The good thing is to listen to everyone and uh, and not uh, accept that anyone has the the whole truth. Anyway, um, I wanted to get on to futures markets, and so that is a very important topic uh, in finance. And the important thing to understand when I put an S on the end. Futures, that refers to a marketplace uh, with a particular characteristic uh, and uh, as, def as traded on a number of exchanges. Notably in the U.S., the biggest exchange for futures is the chi <coughs> Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which just merged with the Chicago Board of Trade. Uh, and they are now called the CME Group. Uh, so futures, since it has its origin in agriculture, is a Chicago thing rather than a New York thing. Chicago is the second c city, or it was the second biggest city, um, hog butcher to the world, <laughs> farmer's uh, marketplace in the Midwest. Uh, and so futures in the United States started there. Uh, and, uh, but actually, futures didn't start in Chicago. Um, it started in Japan uh, on an island uh, in Osaka called Dojima. Um, and uh, in the 1600s, I'm sorry. In the, uh, I'm sorry. Did I, I didn't. Uh, yeah, it was the 1600s. 1673 is the date, uh, date for the first futures market. And so I was just in Osaka again uh, a few months ago, uh, and I again asked, "Can I please see Dojima? <laughs> uh, because it's such a historic place." Uh, and again, they said there's nothing to see there. It's all anything from long ago is gone. Uh, but that was where these markets started. So let's go back. And I'm not sure how well developed it was in 1673, but let's say early 1700s uh, in Dojima. What was happening? Well, it was the rice center for Japan. 
uh, their people, rice merchants, would bring their rice to Dojima and uh, sell them there. And uh, also, uh, naturally, as you would expect, there were big warehouses for rice, uh, which uh, would store it. Uh, would be a natural thing to see at the um, uh, at the uh, center of trade, uh, and uh, it was a big and thriving trade center. Uh, so, people when they buy, and so incidentally, th let's talk about the fundamental problem. Uh, agricultural commodities like rice are harvested typically once a year. Actually, I think rice has more than one harvest. Um, but let's, uh, let's just simplify it. I say it's harvested once per year. And people depend on it for their lives, actually, because uh, they need the food for, uh, for, their, for the whole year. So that means there's a storage business. Rice has to be stored. You have to keep it away from moisture uh, and rot and away from rats and vermin. And that's a business. And it's a very important business for any, uh, any country. If it isn't rice, it would be some other grain, which is stored. And so, uh, when people buy and sell grain, they know it's going. Th th they're thinking out at least a year because that's how long the cycle is for one one harvest, one uh, one cycle. And so, lots of contracts are signed to buy and sell rice, but typically at some future date. So, uh, well, we talk about spot contracts. Uh, means buying and selling something right now. So if you show up at the warehouse and say, I've got my wagons, I want to load rice in, uh, how much do I have to pay to get rice? That price would be called the spot price, on the spot right now. Uh, but the often, you would show up at the warehouse and you would say, you know, I have some trucks, wagons coming next week or, or next month. And I want to arrange now to, uh, to buy the rice. Uh, and uh, if you say, if you agree on a price today for delivery in one month, that's called a forward contract, okay? Not futures. There's an important distinction between forward and futures. A forward contract, let me explain what a forward contract is. It's very simple. It's a contract between two parties to exchange something at a future date for a price in the future that's predetermined today. So, for example, a forward contract will be uh, between me, uh, a rice merchant, and the warehouse that in two months I will come and take delivery of you know, so many bushels of rice, and then I will pay such and such a price. Okay, that's a forward contract. So before 1673, there were lots of forward contracts and lots of um, people trading in these. And so someone in Dojima thought, why don't we set up a big market for these? Because uh, people have trouble knowing what the price is for a forward <coughs> contract. People would travel around from one warehouse to another, and they get a different price from one or the other. And they kind of wonder what the price is you know, today. So someone said, well, why don't we kind of create a market for forward contracts? Uh, but we don't call them forward contracts. I don't know what they call them in Japan, but I'm just trying to get the idea. So the idea is, let's create a marketplace, uh, a central marketplace, so that all these different – you don't have to go around to 100 different warehouses to try to find the best price. You find out what the real price is. Uh, and so what they did is they created an exchange in Dojima, uh, and the exchange <coughs> had a lot of modern features. It had <coughs> a trading floor. Okay, there was a designated area where people who wanted to trade in rice futures would congregate, uh, and all trades were supposed to be done there. So it became a central marketplace. Um, and uh, so many people came to the exchange floor that it got very noisy. And traders can be very noisy people, shouting and getting upset, uh, trading rapidly back and forth. So in, they developed in Dojima a set of hand signals so that it was so noisy and loud that you couldn't talk sometimes. 
and it was hard to especially to communicate something to someone on the other side of the room. So they invented hand signals. So the traders would be, I don't know exactly what they were, but typically when the, if you had something like this, you hold out your hand with your palm out, that means I want to sell. And if it's four fingers up, that means four contracts. If you put it this way, uh, it would be buying. I want to buy four contracts. <coughs> so those hand signals developed in, in uh, Osaka, and they became a, a mainstay of futures markets after that. Okay. So uh, another thing they did in Japan to create the central market uh, was to standardize uh, the, the rice. So uh, right, standardized. Now uh, this is very important. If you go shopping around to different warehouses to try to buy rice, you'll get some warehouse who says, "Well, I'm charge, uh, you know, I'm charging a higher price, but my rice is better than that other guy's rice. You know, his has some worms in it sometimes. <laughs> Don't trust that other guy, uh, and so or whatever it is. Or you know, even rice isn't all the same, right? There's different varieties, and some of them taste better than others." Uh, so how would you ever know what the price of rice is? It's just a mess. So what they did in Osaka is they made a standard form of rice for delivery in their contract. Okay, that's important because it uh, there's many kinds of rice, but they picked one that's maybe the most common, uh, and then they said that's what all of our contracts are about. So you would be taking delivery of a standard rice. Moreover, at the exchange, they had experts on rice who could tell whether it was that contract. I, it's not the best rice. It's the most common rice. I, I visited the Coffee, Sugar, and Cocoa Exchange in New York once, and jokingly I said, uh, can I have a cup of coffee? <laughs> and so this is the Coffee, Sugar, and Cocoa Exchange. Surely I can get a cup of coffee here. And then the guy said, uh, who was showing me around, he said, well, we could give you a cup of coffee, but it's not what we trade here. <laughs> uh, he says, you wouldn't like the coffee we trade here. It's not Starbucks. Uh, it's the most standard. So they set up a standard for coffee at the coffee shop. Maybe he was being too candid. I don't know if they would say that officially. They set up a standard for coffee at the coffee sugar cocoa exchange, and then no one would ever deliver better coffee than that, right? Well, I have to explain that. Everyone, well, they wouldn't even be allowed to. The whole idea is the contract has standards. Uh, wh what actually happens if you are, have a contract to deliver rice or coffee or anything like that, and there's some expert there who's going to judge whether what you delivered was up to quality standards, and you are a smart business person, you will deliver exactly the minimum quality, right, to fulfill the contract. So it'll never be below the minimum quality because no one uh, can deliver it. The, ex the, the testers will not allow that. And it can't be above the minimum standard because you'd never do that. You'd be stupid to do that. So you always it, it, it always becomes the standard variety. So what they did at the futures market is they then not only had standardized the rice, but they standardized delivery dates. And Delivery locations. So th they then. So what, what? What would you trade on these con in these futures markets? You would be trading. You'd either be buying or selling rice for future delivery on a standardized delivery date at a standardized location, probably one of the warehouses that they designate. Okay. Um, and that might not be the rice you want or the date you want, and yet somehow the market gets going and gets very big. And this is the reason. The, the, what a futures market does that's different from a warehouse market is it sets up a standard price and a liquid market. And, the, uh, and so people end up using the futures market to lock in the price. Or to, or to hedge price risk, and they, they know that the price in the futures market is the meaningful price. You hear all kinds of prices of rice. You know, there'll be rumors here and there. 
uh, the, 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 someone will say, I saw a rice sell for such and such so many yen or whatever it is. Don't believe any of that nonsense. Who knows what was sold or what terms there were or what exigencies there were? Only look at the futures market because the futures market is absolutely standardized. You know the terms of delivery, the location, and everything else. And so uh, what ended up happening is that everyone wanted to trade in the futures market. And it became a huge market. Uh, and then everyone started watching the futures price. Okay, so um, that's that's what we now have. What, what that's what is in a futures. <coughs> I wanted to tell you some other uh, one other curious thing about the uh, well, two other things about the Osaka market is they had trading hours just as we do today. Uh, in other words, only certain hours of the day the floor was open and then it was shut off. And so people get very excited and trade very actively. You have to somehow let people know that the trading uh, time is over and that all trades have to stop at the end of the day. So they had a burning fuse, which they would light in the middle of the trading floor just a few minutes before the end of the day. And you could see this flame. And that meant you better finish your trades right now because when the flame goes out, it's over. Uh, and so we, we don't have fuses anymore. We have clocks <laughs> and a bell that announces the beginning and end at an exchange. Uh, but then there's one other thing they had, which I think is kind of curious, that hasn't been copied. They had people called watermen, who after the fuse went out, they carried buckets of water onto the exchange. And if anybody was still trading, they splashed them with water. <laughs> that was to douse the, the fuses out. Everything is doused for today. Uh, th we don't do that uh, in modern <laughs> futures exchanges. Of course, it's all electronic now. There's no f well, it's getting increasingly electronic. The CME and the CBOT still have trading floors like Dojima's, and they're still using these hand signals, uh, but it's, it's getting lonely there because everything is moving away uh, to the um, uh, everything is moving away to the electronic markets. But you'll still see on CNBC, uh, Bob Pisani will be standing at the uh, T-Bond trading pit, uh, and he'll give his little. Th they focus the camera right on where all the people are acting, and they're still out there jostling, jostling each other and and um, shouting at each other. Uh, so it's still going on, but it's increasingly becoming an electronic market. Um, but I guess the uh, uh, the most important thing to realize about futures markets is that they're different from forward markets in that it uh, with a futures market, when you buy and sell a contract, you are buying and selling with the exchange or the clearinghouse of the exchange, and you do not know the counterparty. <coughs> You do not know who's on the other side. With a forward market, you uh <coughs> with a forward market, you know very well who's on the other side. You're, you're going to a warehouse, and there's this warehouse who's going to take your your grain. Uh, and um, in the warehouse, uh, you better trust the other side because suppose the other side doesn't work. You know, suppose you have your you've loaded up all your rice and you come to the warehouse, and then the guy says, uh, "Oh, I don't, I don't." I don't want to honor the contract. I signed it, but I'm just not going to take it. Or I'm going to lower the price on you. Then you have to sue this guy, you know, and it's a big mess. So uh, the problem with forward contracts is that they're not standardized. You're not dealing with a reputable exchange. With an exchange, there is, of course, a counterparty. If you're selling rice and someone else is buying it, but, but you're, there's an intermediary between you, and that's the exchange. And since the exchange will honor any contract, you don't have to worry about the other side. So that's another reason why futures prices are so much more meaningful than spot or forward prices. Uh, because there's no, uh, let me put it this way, there's no counterparty risk. Unless you worry about the exchange itself. But since the futures exchanges in the US have been here since the 19th century, and they've never lost a contract. People assume, as a first approximation, uh, that there's no counterparty risk. Um, 
But before, I, I, I still haven't maybe fully explained futures, but let me, uh, before we go on, I want to uh, talk a little bit about forwards. Uh, because we, th now we have a slide up here. We do have forward contracts, and they still uh, play an important function. Y the reason is that futures markets, by their very nature, are standardized markets, or you might say they're retail markets. They, they have a huge number of people trading in them, but it's all a standard thing. Forward markets are, uh, are between persons, uh, and so they. They can be the contract can be anything you want, and so forward <coughs> contracts are very important, uh, but they tend to be less. Uh, well, I, I tend to s observe them less because uh, they don't have this newsworthy character. F everyone's talking about futures prices because everyone knows that is a very well-defined central market liquid price. The uh, forward contracts are not liquid. You can't get out of it. So if you, as a rice merchant, sold your rice, if you're, say, a rice farmer, you sold your rice forward to a, uh, to a, uh, to a warehouse, uh, and then you change your mind, you want to get out, uh, you can't, because unless the other guy says, I'll let you out, because you've just got a contract. And so uh, the futures has this active trading in and out, and so the prices seem to mean more. But let's talk about forward. Market. There's forward markets for a lot of things. One very important uh, forward market is the foreign exchange forward market. And this happens a lot because there's tons of businesses that have, they sell things uh, in countries around the world and they get uh, foreign currencies. So if you sell some, you're a bit manufacturer and you sell something in, um, in Japan, uh, then they're paying you in yen uh, and they might be paying you in three months. And so you worry about the exchange rate between dollars and yen. So uh, you want to get it in dollars. So you might want to find uh, a counterparty who will exchange your yen for dollars uh, in three months, uh, or whatever the term is. Uh, and so that's called a forward contract for exchange of currencies. Uh, very simple, okay? I'm getting, I'm selling cars in Japan. That, that sounds, that does happen. <laughs> U.S. cars sold in Japan. Uh, and so I'm going to get. S I, I know I'm going to get this yen in three months. Uh, I just uh, sign a contract with somebody to exchange dollars. We fix the exchange rate. That's called the forward exchange rate. Okay, it's not necessarily the same as today's exchange rate. In fact, it will generally be systematically different. Uh, and so we have this uh, what's called forward interest parity relation. The forward. Now this is an arbitrage relationship that holds very well. In the forward market for foreign exchange, the forward exchange rate—that's yen per dollar—in the case of uh, we're talking about Japan U.S. Uh, equals the spot exchange rate. Uh, that's uh, in uh, in in uh, uh, the y yeah, there it is yen per dollar times one plus the yen interest rate. That's for three months. If it's three months. Uh, horizon times one plus the dollar interest rate, uh, and that that relation holds very well uh, because if it didn't hold, I could make money uh, quickly uh, without risk, and uh, that shouldn't happen, right? Think of it this way: the interest rate in Japan is different from the interest rate in the U.S. Government bonds issued in Japan are perfectly safe. Well, I mean, you could say, that of course, the Japanese government could default, but hey, you know, it's not going to happen. So, uh, to a first approximation, it's not going to. Uh, we'll call that a zero probability. Uh, and same thing with the U.S. So, how can two different countries have different interest rates? Because you would think, what wouldn't investors always invest in the country with the higher interest rate? Why not if it's riskless? Well, there is risk, and that's exchange rate risk. But you can get rid of the risk. By taking a forward contract, so you could say, if you're living in Japan, I note that interest rates are higher in the U.S. than Japan, so I'm going to go. I'm not going to invest in yen uh, bonds. I'm going to invest in U.S. bonds, and then I'm going to cover myself by making a forward contract to get the money back in yen. Uh, well, it, it, that's a very uh, clear thing to do, but the problem is you can't make any money doing it because this. 
holds because of arbitrage. There are so many people who've noticed that, that interest rates are higher in the U.S. than Japan. They're both riskless interest rates. It can't be right that there's this profit opportunity that's riskless. Uh, and so the forward exchange rate satisfies this relationship. Uh, the forward rate equals the spot rate times one the, the relative interest rates. Now this is over the horizon between now. This is not the annual interest rate unless it's uh, an annual uh, forward contract. So if it's a three-month forward contract, this would be the interest earned in three months in yen, and this would be the interest earned in dollars uh, over three months. So that's one kind of forward rate agreement. This market works very well. It satisfies this rela- we've explained, we know this market. It just satisfies the forward interest parity condition. Um, so another um, uh, another market, uh, a, a forward market, is the market for um, uh, different interest rates. Uh, so uh, we we can have a forward f- uh, loan. We can say, I want to make a loan at a future date of a certain maturity. Well, let's tie in the interest rate now. Uh, so R is the contract rate. So suppose you want to either borrow or lend money in the future. Uh, we talked about forward rates implicit in the term structure earlier, uh, and you could try to achieve those forward rates as we talked about earlier by buying and selling government bonds. But this is another way to do it, which may be simpler. Uh, uh, it doesn't involve shorting bonds. You can just make a contract. So uh, uh, there's a contract rate in the forward contract, and the contract says, and the, the contract specifies the contract rate R and the number of days uh, in the contract period. That's how many days hence this contract will be delivered, will be executed. And this is this you can make any forward rate contract you want, but this is the most standard contract. Again, it's between counterparties, so you can do whatever you want. But if you talk with a broker and got a standard contract, you'd probably get this. Now the purpose of this contract is to lock in an interest rate. It's a risk management contract. And so you don't uh, actually want to borrow and lend from this other person. You'll arrange that separately. But you want to protect yourself so that you know today what interest rate you can get in the future. So what they do is they define some uh, measure of actual interest rate, and it could be something like LIBOR. I'll just mention LIBOR, L-I-B-O-R, is the London Interbank Offered Rate. It's just an interest rate that's defined uh, by an agency in London. They have a website, and you can read it. So it's a well-known, well-defined interest rate. So you could say uh, three-month LIBOR is the interest rate, 90 days in the future. D would be 90. Uh, and so what the contract specifies, it also specifies a contract amount, A. Uh, and B is actually usually 360, but sometimes they'll say 365. What, you can write whatever you want in these contracts, but this is standard, typically 360 days. And so all it specifies, what the contract says, there's two counterparties. There's the, the long and the short. Somebody is receiving interest and someone is paying interest. So uh, the settlement is this amount from one side to the other. And this, is, this formula actually it doesn't appear in Fabozzi in exactly this n- notation, but this is in uh, the chapter on futures market. This uh, this equation, uh, although it's written a little differently, it's the same equation appears in Fabozzi uh, in the chapter on futures markets. Uh, so what you do, I- the standard forward contract says one counterparty pays the other this amount, and that is equal to the, uh, the, the uh, actual interest rate minus the contract rate times the number of days times the, number, uh, the contract amount divided by uh, B times 100. This 100 is here because L and R are assumed to be measured in uh, hundreds. So uh, like percent, uh, 3 percent is really 0.03 um, times L times D. Okay? It, this, e- this equation might be easier if you divide both numerator and denominator by 100. 
then you can see all the 100 is doing is correcting the interest rates from percent to, to, for, to uh, uh, like from 3 percent to 0 0.03. So all it's doing, it, all this contract is, is, is an amount, uh, uh, a, a, um, a promise to pay the difference between the contract rate and the actual interest rate on that date. So that effectively allows you, if you want to say borrow at that rate, to lock in the interest rate today, because I will get an amount of money from this contract that will offset any changes in interest rates in the future. So that's a that's another example of a f of a contract. Uh, but I wanted to emphasize here futures, not uh, so. Where am I? Let's talk about futures prices. Okay. Uh, I took this from an old newspaper. It's from my old lecture. Um, this is what used to be in the Wall Street Journal, uh, and uh, this is an example of a futures contract. I'm going to stick here with agricultural futures. Uh, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about financial futures, but I like to talk about agricultural futures because it's just really expanding on the Japan uh, Osaka Dojima story. Uh, and it's it's so earthy, <laughs> agriculture, down to earth. Uh, I think I like to start with that because it seems very simple to understand. Uh, and so I wanted to explain one contract. And I thought I would emphasize corn, uh, and this is uh, as it was laid out uh, in uh, uh, 2001. That was seven years ago. I was giving these lectures seven years ago. <laughs> I clipped it out. <laughs> that was before. Uh, I must have covered it earlier in the semester because I have March 15 <laughs> up there, and we're now April 14. But we'll just use this just as an. Now I, I I'll show you in a second what you can get today. Newspapers just seven years ago covered lots more financial data than they do today because we're moving to the internet. Of course, they had the internet in 2001, but we weren't so uh, into it then. So they still published this in the Wall Street Journal as of 2001. So let me just use this as an example. Now, uh, what is this? This is corn. That's maize. Okay. Uh, it was what this means that one contract is a contract to deliver 5,000 bushels, and the price here is shown in cents per bushel. Okay. And these are the contracts. There is a now. This is today is March 15, 2001. There's a May contract, a July contract. And this is uh, okay. This shows the price over today, which is March 15, 2001. Okay, the guys in the pit at the um, sh this stands for Chicago Board of Trade. I put an O in it, <laughs> but often they just say CBT. There's a, there uh, there's a uh, a corn pit, okay, with uh, with traders, and there might be 50 guys there, guys and girls. Right, <laughs> it's a rough. <laughs> Uh, my colleague Ronnie Walney was uh, worked in the futures pits in Chicago, and she, uh, she told me that um, it was so rough. She was she got pregnant, <laughs> and, and they were she was still coming into work, um, and she got knocked over one day by one of the traders. And then her <laughs> boss said, "No way, you have to take a vacation until the baby is born. <laughs> this is no place for a pregnant woman." Um, it's true they get rough and tumble there. Uh, when I had a tour of the CBOT, this is like ten years ago, I was asking. Um, I, I was observing the guys in the pit were so raucous, uh, and at one point, one trader got another trader in a headlock, and he was dragging <laughs> him around. <laughs> and and uh, I think it was all in fun at that time, anyway. But uh, so the guy said, "Well, you know, we had a good record this year. We've had only two broken arms this year." <laughs> That's a good year. Um, in Chicago, they're not as they're farmers, right? Or I shouldn't be put them down. They're different. They have a different spirit. <laughs> they're not. They're down to earth, real people. Put it that way. And so um, it's fun to watch, but it's, it's unfortunately it's probably too late. Unless you go to the Treasury bond pit, uh, it's all fading away to onto the onto the internet. But anyway, what, what this means is these were the prices that corn took per bushel. Over that day of March 15, so it, the price was going up and down as they were trading all day, um, 
And so uh, this was the, o the opening price when the market opened in the morning. This was the highest price for May futures. This was the uh, lowest price. And this is called the settle, which is uh, essentially the last price, but not necessarily, because uh, the exchange has a settlement committee, and they decide on what is the last price. And the reason it's not the same thing as the last actual trade is that they're worried about somebody trying to manipulate the market and doing something funny with the last trade. So it's, but it's, it's like the last trade. Okay, and so this is the change from the previous day of the price. So this is the price for May delivery at a specified warehouse of corn to Chicago. Okay, uh, and uh, open interest is the number of contracts. So there was 186,000 May contract. That's only two months away, March, April, May. You see, almost all of the open interest is in the short contracts. Okay. Now, if you drive through the country and turn on the radio, um, you will hear at regular intervals the, the announcer will tell you what corn is doing. So they say corn uh, at the latest trading is up to two dollars and eighteen cents a bushel. What price is that guy quoting? It's always going to be the futures price. And so you might say, well, but that's two months in the March, April, May. Why are they talking about May? Because this is March. Why doesn't the announcer tell us that at some warehouse, that, you know, the price today was? Uh, and the reason is that, as I was saying, those prices are not meaningful because they jump around because of crazy reasons. So this is the price. Um, uh, and so the other thing that I want to emphasize is that these. Markets are used to manage risks of holding or raising grain. Most of the time, people who are trading in this market do not complete the contract. In other words, if I let's say I'm a farmer raising corn and I'm worried that uh, the price of corn might fall while I'm raising it and I lose money, right? I'm, you know, if if the world market for corn drops. Then uh, I might not be able to cover my expenses this year, and so I could be at great risk. So I can sell in the futures market, but I probably won't deliver to the futures market. And why not? Because the delivery point is in Chicago, and I'm a farmer in Iowa, and I don't know how to deliver it all the way to Chicago. I'd have to rent trucks and drive to Chicago with my Corn? I'm not going to do that. I, I'm always just delivering to the local grain elevator. In fact, I don't have to. I don't need any truck. The guy will pick it up from my farm, and so uh, that's what I want to do. So what I do typically is I sell in the futures market. I, as a farmer, and then one day before the contract expires, instead of delivering, I will buy it back and cancel out my contract. And then, so all I've done is a purely financial trade in the future. You see the difference? I don't actually want to deliver because it's too, too much trouble to deliver. So you get farmers trading all over the country and all over the world in this market as a way of hedging their corn. And very few of them will ever deliver. The only reason why delivery is kept open as an option is that is what. Settle, that's what determines the price in the market. Ultimately, the only people who deliver are professional arbitrageurs who, on the last day or uh, right when the contract is expiring, they look at the futures price and they say, Maybe I can deliver. Maybe I can buy for less than that and deliver, and I'll really do it. Those are the only people. So if they can buy for less than that and deliver, they'll do it. And so they compete with each other. And that brings the futures price and the spot price in line at the end. Or alternatively, if uh, the, the spot price is above the futures price at the end, then these arbitrageurs will say, hey, I'll take delivery. I'll go there and I'll take delivery on a contract, and then I'll sell it and make money. And it's because of the arbitrageurs that the cash price and the spot price line up at the end. It's not through any. Uh, 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 law or <laughs> requirement. 
And so you see what people are doing. They're using the futures market as a purely financial market. Most people relying on the arbitrageurs to, uh, to uh, enforce the, uh, the futures price converging on the spot price at the end. Most people are not even raising the right kind of corn, maybe. Or I, I don't know how. Or a lot of them certainly aren't. There's all different kinds of corn. <coughs> if you are raising one kind of corn and are hedging your risks with a different kind of corn, that's called cross hedging. Okay? Uh, cross hedging. That means across products. I'm going from one product to another. So I could be raising some of this beautiful Indian corn. That remember, it turns all these different colors, <laughs> and people put it, hang it on their doors in Halloween. Um, that's not suitable for delivery at the CBOT. Uh, so if I'm raising that, there's no market for th it's, a, it's no futures, no big market for that. But it probably correlates with regular corn. So I could cross hedge if I'm raising Indian corn and I'm worried about the price. I can sell in the futures market in Chicago and buy it back the next day. I, I said I was going to show you what's in the Wall Street Journal. I got this this morning from the Wall Street Journal. That's all they have for futures markets in the, in the newspaper. I, unless I missed it, I couldn't find it. Commodities and currencies, they don't have any agricultural futures mentioned at all in, uh, Chicago, in the uh, Wall Street Journal. But uh, as I'm going to talk about next period, most futures has migrated to financial futures anyway. It's the same idea. But it's not agricultural. I don't see anything agricultural up here. Uh, there's commodities. There's <coughs> crude oil, natural gas, um, gold. Everything else is purely financial. Well, actually, we've got the uh, DJAIG Commodity Index. That's an index of a number of prices, probably including agricultural. Uh, and uh, so that, that's traded. Lots more is traded. I went on to CBOT.com. This morning, and I got wheat futures prices. This is uh, well. This is uh, on their website, and you don't need any uh, special permission to get on CBOT.com. They're actually changing the name of the website, though. I think it will be <coughs> CMEGroup.com because of, the, of their merger with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So uh, this is the same thing that we just saw. Uh, this is the price of um, of a bushel of wheat. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, uh, as of uh, uh, it be last Friday, 932 cents a bushel, uh, and it ranged from 885. It closed at its high nine. No, it closed. It, it, it opened at high, its high, and it settled uh, down. So wheat went down on that. Now this is for delivery. In May of 2008, and these contracts go out to 2010. This doesn't show open interest, but um, you understand what this is now. Um, now, the the real the price that uh, we talk about when we talk about commodities is the futures price, overwhelmingly. So uh, the uh, this is the Chicago Board of Trade price for corn. Um, since 1929, uh, we could take it even further back, but because these ex futures exchanges have been going since uh, the uh, CBOT goes back to the 1860s. But anyway, this is a long time horizon uh, plot of the price of corn, uh, and I adjusted it for CPI inflation, and so this shows uh, in dollars per bushel. Of course, contracts are for 5,000 bushels, so you'd have to multiply these numbers. By 5,000. Um, so, uh, and this just shows what has been happening to the real price of corn since 1929. There's a lot of talk recently. I must, you must have heard it about this spike up. Uh, in fact, it's quite a hefty spike up. It's uh, doubled, more than doubled in real terms in just the last couple of years. Do you know why this is? Why is corn getting expensive right now? But what's that? Right. It's Th that's the, the theory. I think it's, it's right. That uh, it's because oil prices are getting high, and because uh, we can make alternative fuels out of um, foodstuffs, uh, cane or 
corn. And so in response to the high oil prices, well also subsidies for ethanol production, corn is being demanded to run automobiles. Uh, and all these rich people who want their SUVs, <laughs> they want to uh, have a, a good drive, are now um, paying more for the corn and bidding it up. And this is a huge international crisis because uh, it's, it's spreading over all of the grains. And it's a, it's a worrisome situation because uh, people in some of the poorest parts of the world cannot tolerate a doubling of the price of grain. Uh, they, they'll starve. Uh, and so this is a huge moral issue that we're facing right now, that in order to keep our cars going, we're driving some people to starvation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't mean to minimize that. I thought it was interesting to look at the whole run of, uh, of corn prices back to 1929, and they have come down a great deal. Uh, I, I, it's quite curious. You know, if you correct for inflation, it was like $15 a bushel in 1950. On top of that, our incomes have risen. And so I think this says something about why futures, agricultural futures are not as prominent as they used to be. It used to be that food was really a lot more expensive and a bigger share of our income. And we live in a, a very plenteous time. This is very unusual by historical standards. Right now, you just eat whatever you want, right? You don't even look at the price, right? It's all so cheap. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't eat caviar for the <laughs> because of price. But uh, we're just in a time of plenty with the real price of food so low. It's not normal times historically. So uh, our agricultural futures are somewhat uh, downplayed, but I wanted to give an example of wheat futures um, because uh, this is um, uh, I, I, we have a reading on the reading list by Holbrook Working. Uh, Holbrook Working was the great theorist of futures markets, and, and it's actually uh, the, read, the reading comes from the 1950s. And he is explaining futures market. I, I like this uh, article because it sets it forth very well. And nothing has changed since the 1950s, uh, except that the markets are electronic now. So I wanted to focus in on one futures market, and this is the market for wheat. Um, and uh, these are the standards for delivery at the uh, Chicago Board of Trade. I got this off their website, and this is current. This is today. Uh, if you one contract is 5,000 bushels, okay, uh, they will accept a number of different kinds of wheat that meet their. There, there must be some standards for quality, no bugs in it, <laughs> whatever else. But they'll accept number two soft red winter, or number two hard red winter, uh, or uh, what does this see? I just copied this from the. No, nar it says no dark northern spring. No, it must be number something. What happened? I must have lost it. Number two, northern spring. And all those are at par. However, you can also deliver no uh, number one, soft red winter. That's different because this is number two, soft red winter. Or number one, hard red winter. Or number one, dark northern spring. And no number one, northern spring. And you get three cents a bushel over the contract price. What they're trying to do is recognize that there's so many different kinds of wheat. Um, and so I thought um, uh, we would um, remind ourselves of, um, of what uh, they are. Uh, one, see, hard, uh, hard and so soft wheat is used for making biscuits and bre breakfast cereals and cakes, and hard wheat is used for making bread. Uh, and if you, if you do baking, you should not just always use all-purpose flour. You should get the different varieties, and that's what is being mentioned here, these different uh, varieties. Um, okay, now I wanted to, uh, let me see. Uh, I wanted to talk about the Holbrook Working paper. Uh, Holbrook Working talks about, um, sorry, I'm having trouble, about, um, uh, is that, let me, the, the difference between winter, is anyone here who is a farmer? <laughs> Did anyone grow up on a farm? Can anyone tell the story of uh, winter wheat? No, nope, nobody. We're not very down-to-earth people here, are we? 
<laughs> there's two, two planting. There's winter wheat and spring wheat. Winter wheat, you plant it in the winter, and you harvest it in the spring. Uh, it stays in the ground all winter, and it comes up the first thing, and it's coming up now. And you harvest winter wheat in May, so we're almost close to the harvest. Did you know that? There are these wa wa amber waves of grain blowing in the wind out there in the wheat belt right now, uh, and they're, they're, they will soon be harvested in uh, another month and a half. Spring wheat, you plant it in the spring and you harvest it in the fall. Uh, but they're allowing now delivery of either one. When Holbrook Working wrote the paper, there was a separate contract for hard winter wheat. Uh, and so I think that there's some consolidation of these markets as agricultural futures is becoming less important. So that's why we just have uh, this is the only CBOT wheat market uh, that's listed now. Okay, so um, you understand what the contract is. The contract is to deliver one of these varieties, and there's a separate contract for each of these dates. Uh, and okay. So the, what is the pricing? Uh, this is the thing. What is the futures price? Uh, now, there's th this is what the, uh, I'm going to try to conclude on. It depends on whether wheat is in storage or not. Normally, wheat is in storage because we only harvest a particular variety once a year, and we have to consume it all year, right? So after the harvest, the warehouses get full, and then they're, they're brimming with wheat, okay? And then as the year goes down, the warehouses deplete their contents of wheat, and it hits zero right when the new harvest comes in, and then it all gets put back, it back into the warehouse. This is a physical necessity. Uh, when there is wheat in storage, normally, most of the time, this relation should hold. The price of the futures contract should equal the spot price times 1 plus the interest rate between now and delivery. Uh, and that, is, that means that if, say, interest rates are 5% a year and the delivery is in six months, then this should be .025, right? Half of a year. I want to it's not annual interest rate. It's the interest rate until delivery. Or if it's a third of a year, you know, you have to divide by whatever the uh, it's the interest from from today until delivery date, and S is the cost of storage from today until the delivery date. This should hold normally all the time, and why is that? Because if I'm running a warehouse storing <coughs> grain, I'm uh, I can either sell at the spot price or I can uh, today I can always unload my warehouse and sell it today or I can wait and deliver it in the future at the futures contract but at today as a warehouse I'm losing money because of the cost of storage uh, I have to pay insurance and I have to do other things that are that that maintain the quality of my storage and that's s on top of that I'm losing on interest because if I'm storing the grain, I'm not getting interest on the money that I paid for that grain. So that's another loss to me. So this is the break even for storing grain. If the futures price is enough above the spot price that it pays for my interest cost and my storage cost, I'm making money storing grain, right? If, if the futures price is below this, I'm not going to store grain. I'll unload my warehouse. Why should I store grain for another minute? If I'm a professional warehouse offer and I see that I can make more money by selling my grain today, then I will do it. Um, conversely, if the futures price is above the spot price, uh, then I'm going to want to store more grain. I'm going to go out and buy up uh, other grain, <coughs> and that's going to tend to force the spot price up. So this relationship tends to hold almost all the time. Or you might say it holds all the time if you interpret it correctly. Normally, the futures price is above the cash price because interest rates are positive and storage costs are positive. And it has to be that way. The normal 
course of, brain, of grain prices over the harvest year is to rise as the year progresses. Because it has to be that way. The grain is cheapest right after the harvest when there's a lots of grain around, uh, and then the grain price goes up steadily throughout the year until the new harvest comes in, and then it collapses. So it's the, the, the price of grain over the year uh, is uh, it's a sawtooth pattern. Uh, if there's nothing interfering with it, the, the uh, price of grain uh, will tend to look like this. Okay, and, and these are the harvests, right? And, and the reason the price of grain is going up between harvests is to compensate the warehouse owners. They're not going to do this business if they're not getting compensated. So this is almost like an iron law. This is going to hold. Um, but it doesn't necessarily hold uh, in a given year because there's other things that affect price. Uh, so this is what I was saying, that arbitrage enforces spare, spare value. But there is a problem. If there is no grain in storage, so for example, right at the harvest end, when the harvest is coming in, the relation between futures and spot price can become very erratic. The futures price can be way below the fair value. The, the right hand side, spot times 1 plus R plus S is called fair value. Futures can be below fair value, uh, and, and, and there's no way to, for arbitrage to make up uh, the difference because. Uh, there's nothing. I if the futures were very low, um, let me see. You would want to uh, take money out of take grain out of storage and sell it on the spot price, spot market. But if there is no grain in storage, you can't do that. So it sometimes happens uh, when the grain is not in storage that uh, the price of the future is below fair value. But there's another interpretation of it. People would say. Well, but there is still some grain in storage. It's not gone everywhere. Uh, so how can it sometimes be that the futures price is below fair value? Well, you might say, and this is um, that uh, that the you could either say that sometimes the relationship between price and fair value is violated, or you could say no, it's never violated, but sometimes the storage cost is negative. Uh, and so we have something called convenience yield, which is a negative storage cost. Suppose you were a, a, a corn merchant, and you're noting that right now the market is in backwardation. The futures price is less than the spot price. So you're thinking, uh, I, wanna, I want to get grain somehow uh, and sell it on the spot market, and I'll make money. Uh, so you go around trying to find someone to sell you grain, and you find that someone has it and won't sell it to you. And you'd say, well, why not? Uh, and the guy will say, because I need this grain. Who has grain when, when the market is in backwardation? Uh, it's somebody who really needs it. So for example, in the case of, uh, of wheat, you might find that you go to the factory that makes Wheaties, okay, <laughs> and you say, uh, uh, I, I'd like to buy your wheat. Uh, I'm noting that uh, uh, the, the spot price is really high. Well, you won't tell them that. You say, I just want to buy your wheat. Whatever you've got, I'll buy it at the. Uh, um, uh, at the uh, and, and, or so, but the, the, I, I shouldn't put it that way. I guess I'm saying that it's not going to work if you do. Why doesn't the Wheaties manufacturer sell its grain on the spot market? The reason is that they need wheat to make Wheaties, <laughs> and so uh, th for them, they want to have some on hand. They might think, well, if we didn't have any storage of wheat, we would be at the mercy of delivery, and who knows when th the harvest is out now, we might not be able to get any wheat, and we might have to shut our whole factory down and tell everyone to take a day off. That costs us a lot of money. So you know, we're, we really need to have wheat in storage. At the Wheaties <laughs> factory, and so at w when the market is in backwardation, uh, the um, the only grain that's stored is is the um, 
is the grain that's there for convenience purpose. So I'm just going to go through the example that Holbrook Working gives uh, in his reading, which you have. Uh, back then, there was a number two hard winter wheat Kansas City <laughs> future. Maybe there still is. I don't know. They're not CBOT. But he's, we're going to do this 1956 or 7 story. Okay. Um, oh, here, I have it here. Hard wheat is used for bread, soft wheat for fire. Remember, this is a cooking tip. All right. Uh, you can buy bread flour, I tell you, at the grocery store, and you can buy cake flour, uh, and um, it, they're different. So, the, the Holbrook working is just talking about what happens in the typical year for hard winter wheat. So, we're starting out now with July 2. Uh, July 2, uh, typical year, a spot wheat was uh, 229 cents a bushel. That's the price on July 2. The September future is 232 cents a bushel. So the difference between the future and the spot is called the basis, uh, which is three cents a bushel. He, uh, another term is uh, spot premium, but that would be minus three. But that's ju let's just talk about basis. The basis is the futures price minus the spot price. All right. Uh, so that, this is just a typical story. So the futures price is selling for higher, as it should be. Because uh, between July and September, this is winter wheat. The harvest is recently, and the harvest came in in May, and so this is when there's a lot in storage, uh, and we really should see the the futures price above the spot price, and, and indeed we do. Uh, this spot premium is the is the profit that uh, that is offered to the warehouser. The warehouser looks at this or the basis. The warehouser people in the warehouse business are always watching this every day. And they're looking, oh, a, th a basis of three. And they're thinking, are we going to make money on that? Because they have costs. But this is how much more they can sell it in the future than, than they can sell it today. And so they're comparing the basis with their costs. They do that all the time in the warehouse business. Now, September 4, now it's still, remember the harvest was May. We're not anywhere near the harvest. Uh, here, um, now we still have a, a basis, but now the basis has gotten smaller. This is what happens. So the warehouse operator is starting to feel uncomfortable. I was doing really well in July. I had a basis of three. Now the basis is down to one. And so, you know, it's getting kind of iffy for me whether I can make money. Maybe I should sell. Uh, and so they're always watching these par markets and thinking about that. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I take that back. I forgot. This is both the September future. Right? So uh, the basis should get smaller because we're getting closer to the expiration date, right? Because now it's only one month interest. Well, actually, it's even less. We're almost expiring. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't thinking when I first saw that. The basis should shrink to zero as the time as you approach the expiration of the contract. <coughs> so someone in a warehouse. Uh, who's worried about the fluctuation in the grain will sell it in the futures market uh, and then expect to get the basis because it uh, doesn't matter what the price of grain does, the spot and the futures price should converge. The basis should go to zero. And the three cents a bushel is the profit that they make on the futures trade. Uh, and so, and it's, uh, it's riskless for them at the warehouse because they're hedging the price risk. And then it becomes a nice, clean, and easy business. So I'm looking in July 2 to see what are my costs at the warehouse. And I'm looking at this basis, and I think if I can keep my costs under three cents a bushel, including interest, uh, then I will make money because this basis is going to converge to zero at the end for sure. And so uh, the spot premium will go from minus three to zero. So this is a normal month. Someone <coughs> storing grain. Had this basis of three cents a bushel and is doing business as usual, storing for less than that and, and making money. And if, if not less than that, they'll get out of it. Um, and so um, then continuing through the year, um, uh, now they roll into December futures because I'm still storing grain. It, it, I, I do this all year, right? I'm trading in the, in the, the nearest month contract. <coughs> 
because that's where the open interest is and that's where all the trading is. And so as soon as the uh, September contract expires, I don't actually want to deliver. I'll sell out and I'll make the profit, which is the, the change in basis. Now, when it comes to, uh, and now September 4, I've made that profit of two cents a bushel, the difference between the three cents a bushel basis and the one cent, and now I start a new contract. So now, because September is expiring, I move in, I roll over into the December contract. Uh, and I'm just going to do this uh, every, every three months. Uh, I'm going to roll over into the next contract. So in this case, I didn't put the basis. The basis was five and three quarters cents a uh, bushel. So now it's looking even better here in September. I mean, it jumps around. The basis jumps around with market conditions, but it's looking good now because I have a basis of five and three quarters cents. Uh, and so I'll buy. An, I'll sell my grain again on a futures contract, and then I will close it out. December when the and this is December one now. Now the price of of, of of wheat has gone up a lot from 238 to 252, but you know it's not going to be a profit for me. I'd, I'd, I'm not. I'm, I'm. I hedged it, but I'll make the, the. For me, the profit is the change in the spot premium. So I made five and three quarters cents a bushel, minus my cost. And I'll just stop. I, I know you're. I'm running out of time. What happens at harvest? I'm doing this all year. Finally, on May, this is the new harvest is coming in, and look what happens. Now this market is suddenly uh, in backwardation. Now look what's happening. The spot premium is 18 cents a bushel. The basis is minus 18. If I hold on, if, if I roll into July futures and hold on, I'm going to lose really big time. So I'm out. I'm out of the business. We sell off everything in the warehouse and we're done. So this is the process by which warehousing is optimized. And we get grain smoothly through the year, but it's a basic principle that we'll see in the next lecture. Uh, extends as well to other um, other kinds of uh, financial futures. So next period, we're going to talk about other kinds of futures, uh, including financial futures.